Nice. Welcome to this keynote, to this closing note, which is called an InfoSec timeline, noteworthy events from 1970 to 2050. And uh, first, a quick word about myself. My name is Mario. Um, I would call myself an ex-researcher because I don't do research anymore, but now I'm a lecturer at the Ruhr University, Ruh University in Bochum, and uh, I'm still running here 53. Wrote a couple of books, a couple of papers, and uh, maintain right now Dom Purify, which is, uh, as you probably know, a browser-based cross scripting sanitizer. And uh, the last weeks have been a pain in the arse because we had a couple of bypasses, which you might have noticed, but we fixed them, and I think we're good again. Um, this is my latest talk, and I think this is pretty much the worst talk I've ever done. I have been trying to kind of lower the quality with uh, every talk in the past years, but I think I have reached... It's pretty much the, the, like, I, I don't think there is, like, more room downstairs. Um, and I noticed that this is actually quite hard to accomplish because I wanted to do, like, a closing note. And with a closing note, you can't really go ahead and kind of confront people with a lot of knowledge or complex thoughts. You just want to have something that's, like, entertaining and dull and just, like, you can lean back and have a good evening. And that's really, really complicated. I was like, maybe it's going to take me a week. But it took me, like, three weeks to deliver something that has zero value. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that you're actually going to enjoy this. So uh, first, we want to find out who's actually here. I, was, I always ask this question. So who here is a penetration tester? Yes, nice. I'm a penetration tester, too. Who here is a developer or defender? Yes, I'm a developer, too. Who here is an ISO or CISO? Nice. Uh, I'm, I'm not an ISO or CISO. Who here is a bug bounty hunter? Excellent. Who here is a psychic? Anybody? <laughs> One? No, no, no. Yeah, fair enough. We might need them because you might need to support me with my visions that are brought to paper with this particular talk because most of the stuff that is in this talk actually never happened and I didn't make it up. It just came to me, so you can't blame me. But we'll see about that. The talk structure is going like this. In Act 1, we're going to talk about the past. We're going to talk about noteworthy events that actually happened. I believe, at least, that they happened, or some sources do. And those are events that had like great relevance in the field of web security, information security, and related areas. And in the second act of the talk, we'll talk about the future. And this is, as mentioned, not stuff that I made up, but this is stuff that actually came to me during visions, at night, or in the sauna, or in the bathtub, and it was just there. So. It kind of tries to precisely tell me InfoSec future. And if you don't like it, don't blame me because I didn't make it up. It just came to me like I'm from somewhere else, like a DET or substances. I don't know, but let's see. <laughs> so, one more important question. If there is people amongst you who don't have plans for tonight, you can win a party ticket because we have still another party going on, the All-Stars party, which is going to happen on a boat. And we have four more slots. So those people who deliver like the stupidest comments and the snarkiest questions or the best heckles have the chance to actually win one of these. And then you can join us on a boat. There's free food, there's free booze, and it's going to be awesome. There's going to be an after party. Um, do your best. There's no such thing as a plus one. If you have a plus one, you have to ask two questions. I mean, that's quite natural. So show me your best. Are you ready to start? Everybody ready to start? Excellent. So let's talk about the past, where everything was much better than it is today, of course. And let's start with the year 1990, uh, 1971. Does anybody know who that is? Nice, well done. I wouldn't have known. I just like Googled for the year 1971 and checked the image search, and <laughs> this popped up. It was like, yeah, that's good. That's, that looks just about right. So in 1971, something interesting happened, because the first actual computer worm was created and was called Creeper. Who here still remembers Creeper? Anybody? Nobody? So the author, Bob Thomas, created a piece of software that was supposed to just like bounce between computers, between machines, and it didn't do anything else but that. It just like bounced from machine to machine and left a small message and basically said, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. Of course, it used some bug to kind of propagate, and they had a hard time actually catching it because through the bug it would bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce, but it wouldn't do anything better. But it was actually a computer worm because it propagated on its own through the use of a bug, and uh, there was a primer, apparently. And it led instantaneously to the creation of the first AV software. Is that correct? Can you confirm this from, from like an AV vendor standpoint? 
76? I learned 71, but never. I mean, what are five years? Anyway, so the first AV was actually called Reaper, and was having one task, and the task was to catch Creeper. So it was technically another worm that was bouncing from machine to machine, and the only thing that it actually did was deleting Creeper. So things haven't changed so much until today, but anyway, the first one who actually created this AV piece of software was Ray Tomlinson, and as mentioned, it's called Reaper. I found this quite fascinating, that it's like really, literally that long ago, almost four years. Then, who's that? Yes, that's right. Well done, well done, well done. That's not going to get you a party invite. You have to get better with that. So, Anyway, that's KISS. And in the year 1980, where KISS was really huge, the first actual intrusion detection system was created. And it was created by the NSA. Because basically someone there said, well, there is such a thing as computer intrusions. Like, this stuff is slowly getting popular. We need to kind of do something against this. And it was James Anderson of NSA who came up with a basic idea and classified what kind of threats they want to detect. And basically what he created was a toolkit that was like easy t easing it for administrators and similar personnel to review user access logs, file access logs, and all this kind of stuff and kind of get it into an easily digestible form. But factually, there was an intrusion detection system because it was supposed to detect intrusions many, many years ago. And in the same year, apparently, the infamous group, the 414s, were founded. Anybody still remembers the 414s? They are described as a bunch of Milwaukee teenagers, and 414 is actually like the number called for Milwaukee, who uh, use computers to do like shitty stuff and screw people up. And they were apparently the first hackers that were labeled as such who caused financial damage. And uh, the legend has it that the financial damage was around about $1,500, so not that much. But uh, they just deleted some billing records from some company. They uh, hacked the servers and uh, then went with that. And uh, that was quite interesting because apparently that was the first group ever noticed as such. as like an actual hacking group alleged with causing financial damage and really just like trying to wreak havoc and destruction. I think in the end they were caught and there was like interviews and there was like uh, peak popularity and then there was a book and then no one spoke about them anymore. This is the year 1981 in which people were really well dressed and... Uh, <laughs> Like, you punch this into Google and you find this as an image search result. So that's the picture I want for this slide. That just looks so good. It's like nice. Anybody knows who that is? Is that Abba? No, that's not Abba, right? No. Nice. Nice. I would not know that. Um, but one of the problems is that I was born this year, so it was just like really far too young to actually notice that they were around. Um, and I didn't find anything else from that year that had relevance, so we can just probably move on from that slide and go to the next one. And look at 1986. With, who is that? George Michael, certainly. That's a very good one. <laughs> Mr. T, that's correct. And Boy George, right. Um, I'm not really sure what happened in this room, but they were having a good mood, and I think they had a good time, so uh, let's talk about it for a second instead. So in this particular year, 1986... Astronomer Clifford Stahl captured Marcus Hess, and Marcus Hess was allegedly a German hacker and a KGB recruit, and he was apparently one of the people who managed to kind of infiltrate U.S. military systems and succeeded doing that and stole a lot of data. And Cliff put up a honeypot, so that was like a brilliant idea back then, because apparently that was the first time that ever someone came up with that particular idea, and indeed set up what we know today as a honeypot, so a system that looks vulnerable but isn't, and then queries so much information from the attacker until they can actually find that person and raid their house. So this year was the first year that apparently had a politically motivated hack, at least the first documented one. Maybe there's more, but I don't know about them. There is the first documented use of an actual honeypot in the field of cybercrime. And there's also like the first documented use ever of cyber forensics, because they kind of then, of course, looked at the traces that Marcus left in that honeypot and then eventually managed to find him and uh, put him in jail. Quite tragic story, even so, but well, a lot of primers that year. Another thing that happened this year was that the first actual design for a real IDS was being modeled by Dorothy E. Danning, and she was assisted by Peter G. Newman, and uh, they released this as a product, which was new back then, because that was one of the first actual InfoSec products um, for like larger clients and customers, and it was released by the company called SRI as Intrusion Detection Expert System, so IDES, and now we have only IDS, so the experts have left, but um, anyway... And it would both look at user and network-level data, so it was quite comprehensive and actually helped 
catching intrusions back then. There's even a paper, an academic paper, so people put a lot of effort into that back then. And I really encourage you to check that out because the basic mechanics of what they created in that particular year, many, many years ago, is still what we use today, just with some added sugar. Then in 1997, uh, who, who recognizes those two? Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton? Yes? No? No. Almost. Um, she was later starring, uh, first she was starring in Terminator and then later in Terminator 2, and I think there was some kind of weird uh, series about the Beauty and the Beast, which hopefully... Was a good one? I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> You're close to, to deserving your ticket, to earn your ticket, but not quite yet. I, I, need, I need more. Yes? Oh, we're coming to that later on, actually, so don't, don't steal that slide. <laughs> so, 1987. Um, and this year, no shit, 1987, someone made like a really interesting statement. It was computer scientist Fred Cohan who noted the following. He basically said it is impossible, impossible to detect an intrusion in every case and that the resources needed to detect intrusions grow with the amount of usage. Really? No shit. So you can't have a system that detects all attacks. And they, they actually figured that out in 1987. And I think everybody here, except for maybe some marketing people, might actually believe that. Because you can't. <laughs> Sorry. However, we need to also look at the other side of the medal. And basically, uh, Cohen also believed that there's positive viruses... And he even himself created a positive virus that would spread along the network and infect your machine and then compress your executables so you have more drive space. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing this kind of statement and comparing with the other one and putting this into context kind of makes you want to rethink whether this was so wise of a statement, but I still think this one holds. Anyway, so in year 1998, who's that? Who could that be? That's Prince, very nice. Prince was very well known, and uh, another thing happened that was quite well known, because that was the year when Sir Robert Morris had an exciting and excellent idea, because he was like, hmm, I wonder, how big is the internet? I don't know, but I really would like to know. Let's find out. How can we find out? I could just write a worm. This kind of propagates to every single machine on the internet, and just like pings back how many machines there are. Fantastic idea. So he created that software and he used another known bug back then and just basically created a software that went from machine to machine with the aims, with the goals of creating and measuring the size of the internet. I think some of you might already know that this particular thing was not very successful. So I'm not really sure if he actually found out about the size of the internet, but uh, well, other things happened. Um, because what he created was effective for the Morris worm, and he created like lots of financial damage. Other people came up with the same idea later on, but uh, he really caused some damage. And uh, later in 1989, um, this is not Slipknot, this is uh, Metallica. Later in 1989, um, it was analyzed by a couple of entities that apparently the damage that was caused by the Morris worm was somewhere between 100k and 10 mil which leaves some wiggle room, so it's apparently very hard to measure that, but people were like really pissed about this worm, and that was like actual financial damage compared to the 1.5k that the 414s apparently did. Um, again, Clifford Stahl saves the day, the hobby astronomer, and uh, was also aiding with uh, finding ways to cleanse machines from the computers and so on. I'm not really sure why he's like part of the whole scene, but uh, he was present with all these computer security incidents back then and apparently had like a good hand for that, so that was very nice. And another thing that happened back then was that effectively the first ransomware was being created and unleashed in 1989. Uh, 98, sorry. And it even, it even had an end user license agreement. So you would actually kind of accept the agreement when this thing runs, but uh, it was like a hidden agreement and stuff like this. And what it did was it would replace your auto exec bug file. Who you still know is auto exec bug files and configs and all these things. Beautiful, right? I love them as a child. So the, what the thing was doing was that effectively after 90 reboots, so you have to reboot like uh, don't show this message again. You had to reboot like 90 times. Then all of a sudden, this particular software would hide your directories and encrypt only the names of all the files. And then you had to kind of send a check to a post office box in Panama with like 198 US dollars. And then you would eventually receive a letter. And this letter would give you instructions on how to get your files back. So factually, I think that counts as the first ransom. Was it the first? Or was it just a very early one? My sources say it's the first, but uh, maybe you know better. Yes, nice. That's him, by the way. And as you can see from, from the TED Talk setup with all the oscillators and all the cool uh, tech here, um, that must have been quite awesome. And I would watch you talk, I would love to watch you talk of his, but I'm not sure if he's still around, but uh, that was Clifford Stoll, actually. 
Then in 1990, um, a lot of interesting things happened, including this very interesting photo bump here. Um, <laughs> and, it's like, I had, this, I had this weird effect, so I was Googling like numbers, just like year numbers, and starting from a certain year on, I every single time found Trump. And I don't know why, like every single year, I would just like get Trump shoved in my face, and there was no way around this. But anyway, like try this yourself. I had the result, and I had it for all the years starting here to uh, at some point right now. So, well, I mean, you did something right, I guess. So, in this particular year, uh, things actually get serious particularly hacking, because it gets, it becomes illegal. And it was the year in which, in the UK, the Computer Misuse Act was being uh, released. And basically it said that any form of unauthorized attempts to access computer systems is now illegal. People were protesting a lot back then because the law was very vague and no one actually knew what was illegal and what wasn't. But uh, this is not something uh, unheard of. Um, so basically, at some point, people were fine a bit uh, with that and the dust settled and the, the act was renovated here and there and modified and amended and whatnot. But it was the first year in which apparently you couldn't hack anymore without facing legal consequences, which is quite interesting. Then, in year 1991, who's that? Nice, very good, very good. In this particular year, the AV industry strangely started booming. Because people started to kind of get the concept of virus, and the virus is something bad, and you don't want to have it on your computer, because then your computer gets sick. So you need medicine, and that's particularly this product. And there was hundreds of products, partly from like very, very shady uh, companies that were flooding the market, and they all did the same. They basically all kind of worked on building up a huge database of checksums and signatures, so to say, and then checking your disk contents, whether there was any match, and if that was the case, then the stuff would be quarantined or deleted or if something else happened. The software back then wasn't very great, and people complained a lot about false alerts, intense resource use, uh, massive user frustration, like people accidentally had their stuff removed when there was nothing, nothing going on, or the machine was like slowed down to the very maximum. But it didn't matter, because people bought this particular software like crazy, because everybody had the idea that it's actual medicine, which is quite interesting, I think. Then 1994, this particular... Challenging photo was taken. I don't, I don't think that would be possible today, would it? And I think that's a good thing. Like we, we developed as mankind to the point of not making these kinds of photo anymore. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a monument of, of those years. And something really interesting happened. Because in 1994, not only this photo was taken, but also Lou Montulli and John Gian Andrea, they write the initial specification for cookies. And uh, this specification made it into Netscape 0.9-beta. was released on October 13th, 1994. And it was the first browser to ever support cookies. And as you can see, this is like a significant change, a significant revolution on the web because that kind of removes the focus from websites and gives us the ability to create web applications, like actual applications that recognize the users and then do stuff that is like only for that particular user and so on. Needless to say, they filed a patent, so cookie technology is patented, and it's like uh, the patent number 57746670 that was granted even so in year 1998. Um, it was quite funny because Microsoft saw this and was like, ooh, cookies, that's actually quite cool, but there's a patent, so whatever, we need to kind of buy this thing, and then they released Internet Explorer 2.0, and it also supported cookies, and all of a sudden, the web got much more interesting. And the funny thing is that no one noticed. Like, literally no one from the user base was even aware of the fact that all of a sudden there is no cookies. It took a long time, around about a year, for people to figure out that something was going on. That was in the year 1995. Or was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite yet. It took more time. Either way, in 1995, people started to take the World Wide Web more seriously because it was appearing in mass media and it was like more or less universally accepted. And they recognized the new medium as such, as something that is not just for freaks in the cellar anymore. And back then, Netscape Navigator was pretty much the most widely used web browser. It was like supreme, superior to all other browsers. And Microsoft was like panicking a little bit because they basically said like, well, we need to kind of also have a browser. Um, take note that the cookie support came later. Um, but anyway, they also noticed that they need to do something and then they liked license Mosaic, like this old ancient prototype browser from back then, and based on that they actually created IE1, and then pushed release after release with even the second one in the same year that then supported cookies and so on. So that was like very, very fast paced because everybody got it, like the web is here and it's not going to go anywhere. So that was fascinating days. I was 14, I knew nothing of that stuff back then. I was still playing with Legos, I think. Well. 
in effect, the web was starting to be available for free to everybody because back in the early days, Netscape actually cost money. So you had to pay for that. You had to pay for getting a software that allows you to use the internet. And then Microsoft came and says like, yeah, we're going to kind of destroy your business because we're going to offer your browser, our browser for free. And indeed they did. And then Netscape had to do the same and face like lots of financial trouble. And all the other very popular browsers back then, like for example, Internet Works, Quarter Deck Browser, InterApp, and even Win Tapestry, they also kind of had to release free versions because because otherwise they didn't have any chance to compete with Microsoft anymore. So a lot of stuff happened back then. And some people say that in this particular year, they actually started the browser wars and the first browser wars, because meanwhile we have free as far as I know. Needless to say, in this particular year, a very important movie was released as well. That was Hackers, that gave attention to the infosex scene on the big screen. And some people actually even liked that movie, including myself, although it has a couple of logic flaws, but well. Anyway. In the year 1996, who, who remembers this band? <laughs> Ex. <laughs> I think it's the boy band with girls or a girl band with boys. I'm not really super sure, but uh, probably the music was great. Anyway, like in this particular year, people noticed cookies. Like it took two years for them to figure out that something is going on that is tracking information of theirs locally and com comparing this with server-side information to give them identity on the web. Because no one told them. The like, cookies were just there all of a sudden. There was no notifications like, hey, we have cookies now and they can do this and this and that, good stuff and bad stuff. But they just appeared. And it was the Financial Times who found it out. There was a big scoop and some of the reporters actually looked at the browsers and realized, oh, there is something that is tracking information. And then they did a piece on that and people realized, oh, there is something in our browsers that is like tracking us and doing evil things. And that actually made some waves back then. People were like that scared about cookies. I mean, needless to say, you can use cookies for bad and you can use them for good, but people were completely scared about cookies being used for bad. And even when that far that like newspapers with like decent renome recommended to people to kind of turn off cookies entirely. And then they had their PHP session ID in the URL and they would send a lot of links with ICQ and then other people were them. So that was not a great idea. But it even made it up to the US FTC and there was like hearings, multiple hearings, and people were like really scared about cookies. I mean, if something like this came out today, people would be like, oh, pff, there's another one. But back then they were like out of their minds. Incredible. So who's that? <laughs> Yeah. Now you have your slides. <laughs> anyway, that's the dude. That's not Martin. So, um, in, this <laughs> in this year, the Big Lebowski <laughs> was released. <laughs> anyway, in this year, next to the, to the Big Lebowski, they also realized that there's a thing called SQL injection. And they had their minds blown. They were like, what? You can concatenate user input into existing queries? How do you, this is magic, this is voodoo. How do you do this? Yeah, but just concatenating. <gasps> oh my God, they were completely freaked out. And it was first documented by Jeff Forrestal, um, who also went by the, uh, by the nickname Rainforest Puppy or RFP. And apparently the first source ever documenting SQL injection was the Frag Magazine in issue number uh, uh, 54. And before that, no one actually knew that kind of problem. And he stated that people can possibly piggyback SQL commands into your statements. And people were like, what? Um, there's a story going around where people were like so mind blown about this that he went around in the States and do consulting and he would ask for like daily rates of like $7,000 because people were ready to pay that because his calendar was so booked out. So like, come to us, explain us concatenation. But anyway... And the only good thing back then was that most websites actually didn't have any databases. Uh, they usually just like talked to something like MS Access style directly. So it wasn't that bad and this was just like building up. And Microsoft also stayed quite cool because they were like, yeah, it's actually not that bad. I would worry about that. Um, yeah, sure. That was not the best prediction that Microsoft ever did in terms of security. But they did a really good one in the year when Fight Club came out because they realized for the first ones, or being the first ones, that there is a lot of potential in cross-site scripting. Because basically MSRC figured out that cross-site scripting is a massive threat that is actually already being used, that it's hard to track, you have to check your logs and whatnots, and uh, try to formalize the whole thing by giving it a name and releasing some papers that basically state what it is and what you can do against this. And as we all know, 20 years later, it's still one of the most common web vulnerabilities, and it was only discovered more or less by accident because someone noticed that something is quite fishy and that someone might have the possibility to steal your cookies and do good stuff with it, uh, do bad stuff with it. 
In the same year, the first web application firewall gets built and the first units get sold. And the company is called Perfecto Technologies. Anybody here from Perfecto Technologies? Is that company still around? No? Hmm. And they called it AppShield. And it was the first web application firewall even called like that. And it was strangely targeting e-commerce because we made the experience that e-commerce is the last of all industries that cares about IT security. Um, so uh, anyway, they targeted them and maybe then the company disappeared. But they targeted a lot of attacks as well. So for example, people back then were scared of hidden field manipulation. That's the actual list of features that it had back then. Hidden field manipulation. Cookie poisoning, parameter tempering, buffer overflow, cross-site scripting, backdoor or debug options, stealth commanding. I'm not really sure what that is. Someone could help me explaining that. Forced browsing. I think they mean CSERF. Third-party misconfigurations and known vulnerabilities. And that was the feature list in 1999. Um, and if you compare it with feature lists of today, there's not that much difference, I guess. Anyway, we move on to the year 2001, in which IE6 was literally the best browser ever. It was even better than IE55. And if you combine both browsers in terms of market share, in terms of usage, you would see that they pretty much ruled the entire internet. Like combined, they had 95% market share. Everybody was using IE, including myself. I was a student back then, and uh, I was quite fascinated by the internet. I had like modem and ISDN connections, very, very slow. But I was like so enchanted by all the toolbars. I all of a sudden, it's like all those new features and functionalities were like, nice. I just have to go there. And whoops, I have a new toolbar that is so convenient. And that was pretty much daily business back then. And uh, well, one of the problems that happened back then is that Microsoft didn't even want to put too much more investment into IE uh, for various reasons, including legal ones. And they basically left the browser as it was, which was, of course, a terrible state because it was built in a rush and a lot of bugs were in there. But anyway, we're going to talk about that later. In the same year, according to my sources, they also started the OWASP project by Mark Curfee and joined by Jeff Williams as a volunteer chair of OWASP. So this was the year in which it all began. And in the same year, a lot happened back then, researchers discovered CSERF. They were like, oh, you can actually trigger requests from a different origin and they still have the cookies because the browser can't tell apart from where they come. And in this particular year, first exploits apparently started popping up in the wild. But researchers also quickly figured out that there's like literally no chance to actually finding out whether you had CSERF or whether you were attacked by a CSERF attack or not because you wouldn't see it in the logs. It's just a regular request coming from your machine. So there was like a very, very tricky bug and showing us a bit more impressively that there is no way to detect all possible intrusions. You just need to kind of build something against them. But to detect CSERF, you're going to really have a hard time. Then in year 2002, who's that? Britney, yes. Britney becomes popular and the EU, um, probably inspired by that, launched the Directive on Privacy and Electronic Communications. And that was another reaction to cookies because users now need to consent to the use of cookies. That's when this whole thing started with the, hey, this website is using cookies. Do you really want that or not? What can we do to make your life even harder? And uh, there was a paragraph that basically specified clearly that there must be a possibility given to the user of denying any form of storage operation by the web search, any, any form of operation that, that can store anything of whatever kind. And uh, website owners were confronted with a hard problem because that was not that easy. And very much important in this year, a very well-known attack gets discovered too, and that is clickjacking. Clickjacking got discovered by Jesse Ruderman. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't design a logo because that kind of uh, marketing strategy wasn't around back then. But he just filed a bug ticket on Bugzilla. And, uh, well, the effect was that no one noticed that. And I think the ticket is actually still there. Uh, is it fixed? No, right? Because there's no fix. It's, it's not exactly. Like and, uh, well, he found out that there's a possibility to make iframes transparent. But his own marketing skills were not good enough to kind of make people aware of the actual risks. So this particular attack was slumbering in its secret cave that was Bugzilla for a very long time. And it took a couple of years for some people to rediscover it. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Mod security gets kicked off in the same year, 2002. A web application firewall for people without big wallets. Awesome project, still alive. And started by Ivan Ristich, who is now, I think, still at SSL Labs or something like this. I'm not super sure. Oh, ah, okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> Hard noise, true, yeah. Anyway, so that was good kicked off in this particular year, and we can move on to year 2003. What's that? Who knows? Okay. I still have four of these things. I'm a kind of, kind of a bit disappointed. I need more interactivity here. No heckling, no questions, no comments. 
That was good, but not good enough. <laughs> All right, in 2003, a very, very famous group was started, and it was the group uh, Anonymous. And they often became labeled as international hacktivist group uh, with pretty much a mission, but no one knew what that mission was. And they also used this very, very characteristic sign of theirs, which was the Guy Fox mask. Um, me? No, I was far too stupid for these kinds of things. <laughs> 2003, I was still, I think, in like second semester and learned basic math, so no. -uh. Well... They were alleged to have committed a variety of cyber crimes. There was lots of allegations and lots of attribution. Nobody really knows what they actually did or who was where and what was happening here. There was a couple of arrests. Um, but it was noted by some CEOs that indeed the mask sales went up because no one would buy these masks before and all of a sudden people did. So there was companies that actually were created just to sell those masks because of Anonymous. Fair enough. But more importantly, the Ovas to Temp project gets published for the first time. And I think one can safely say, at least the internet says so, that the Ovas to Temp project is pretty much the most cited document document in information security history. Like, no, there is no other document, no other paper that has been cited more often than the OS Top 10, so that's quite a decent success, I would say. Then, in 2004, things get even more interesting. Uh, this is Mark Zuckerberg uh, on, on tape, and I think he got confronted with some, some data leakage, so he had to kind of burp in surprise. And uh, that happened back then. Or like, you, you need to follow the press. It's amazing. That actually happened back then already, just no one cared. And uh, in this particular year, there was like the first well-known and documented mass exploitation of IE box. Because, needless to say, everybody was still using IE like crazy. That was a browser with a market share of 95%. So it was like the most juicy possible attack target that you could have. And one of the malwares actually did it uh, and managed to kind of infect more than tens of millions of users' PCs. And it was exclusively free through IE security box. You would just like chain a couple of bugs, you would visit a website then where the uh, HTML and the JavaScript code was hidden, and then boom, your machine was backdoored. Probably the toolbars that I caught while browsing the map, uh, the web very naively were coming from this particular Trojan, and probably I caught it myself, and I would even assume that probably 50% of the room here also had this kind of Trojan at some point on some machine in their lives because it was really that popular. And uh, getting wind from that as well, Firefox 1.0 was released with huge buzz. In Germany, we had like this campaign with like a newspaper printout. I think it was like an entire page that said fire or fire or something like this. And they really tried to kind of get people away from IE, which was a good thing. Um, first, they called it Phoenix, which was a super nice name. But then the BIOS manufacturer called Phoenix Technologies realized that they have a browser too but it's like a BIOS-based browser, and I don't even know what that means. So they threatened to sue because their thing was called Phoenix First Wear Connect, and yeah, then Phoenix didn't happen, but Firefox happened, which I think sounds a bit better. And before Firefox was pushed away by Chrome and began its low downfall, sad downfall in 2010, it rapidly gained market share and everybody was using Firefox. Everybody who was cool was using Firefox. And one can safely say that the second browser wars were beginning and lasted from 2004 to 2017, 13 years. And one of the results there was that in April 2004, the What WG was created to kind of counter the slowness of the W3C and find a way to actually get the standards and the specs up to par with what people actually want, with what people actually need. Then, in 2005, this movie came out. Which was the movie? Yeah, well, that was the easy one. I made it very easy. But good, well done. Um, ransomware became more popular and more sophisticated. And there was a couple of ransomware families, according to my sources, which might be wrong, but uh, you can correct me because you're sitting in the front row and you know this stuff. Like, for example, GP Code, Archivius, Crotten, or Krotten, and May Archive, and they started to actually utilize RSA encryption. And the key size was increasing, as was uh, the performance of computers. And apparently, GP Code uh, in the variation AG, which was detected in June 2006, had a key that was like whopping 660 bits. So that was pretty good. And much more important in that year, the semi warm was released. Because Sammy Kamkar apparently wanted to impress his girlfriend, as he said himself, and kind of show her how popular he is on MySpace, because MySpace was still a thing back then. And he created a tool software that he basically could put on his own profile, and then it would kind of add everybody or make him be added to everybody's friend list who was visiting that profile. And then he was realizing that it was a little bit slow, and he wanted to have more friends and more shared connections. And then he says, like, well, if I can put this on my profile, I can maybe also put this on other people's profiles, and then I get more friends 
expands over time much faster. But what he forgot that uh, the whole thing was kind of going exponentially, and then uh, MySpace was down for three days, and the United States Secret Service raided his house. Um, and they found his house by looking at license plates of photos that someone in his vicinity or him himself posted at some point. So it was pretty adventurous. And yeah, then he went to jail. And then he couldn't use computers for a while. So please don't write XSS worms because that might actually happen. Um, other people didn't listen to that advice and became actual computer criminals. And the gang around Roberto Gonzalez, they stole apparently at least 45... Uh, 54.7, uh, 45.7, so I'm really bad with numbers. Uh, payment card credentials used by customers of the US retailer TJX. And, uh, this cost the company an apparent 256 million US dollars, which was really expensive at that time. So I think that was one of the, the cyber crimes or one of the attacks back then that was like the most yielding one actually and the most painful one. 2007, I don't have to ask questions about this particular picture because everybody knows. Um, there was an interesting situation coming up where all of a sudden all researchers and all open source tools that were using like web application scanning as their main purpose were threatened because it showed that a company called Sensic, and I hope I get the facts right here, filed a lawsuit against SPI Dynamics because Sensic was awarded a patent for so-called fault injection technology. And they basically managed to get a patent to be awarded for trying dirty and nasty user input against web applications and seeing what happens, which is pretty much what any scanner does, what any pen tester does. And uh, patent lawyers didn't really see it back then and kind of didn't get to the point of saying, like, no, we can't do this. So they got the patent granted and then they started to sue. But uh, the community was very angry. Um, the Sensic website was hacked and defaced, and there was like cross-site scriptings and whatnots. Um, and eventually it got settled because HP bought SPI Dynamics, and HP was too big of a chunk, so Sensic was like scared, and then basically says like, yeah, we're not going to sue you anymore. They reached an agreement, they got some millions, and everything was good again. But people are still a bit scared in the legal field of this particular case, because this is still a bad patent. Um, we never saw anything bad happening with cookies, and we never saw anything bad happening with Oracle owning the trademark JavaScript, for example. But here we actually had someone attacking someone else for something that we would just like generate this with scanning technologies, and that looks quite critical, actually. Let's see. I tried to find a picture from the year 2008, but there's a stupid car that is called 2008, so this is all I found. So I was like, at some point, I was like, I'm just going to give up. Sorry for that. Um, ransomware even gets more sophisticated. They use bigger keys and more sophisticated encryption technologies, and another variation of another variant of GPCO was detected. That was the first one to apparently use like a 1,024-bit RSI key. Is that, is that accurate? Is that making sense? It was on the internet, so I believed it. <laughs> okay. It was deemed to be infeasible to break encrypted uh, the encryption in this particular case before that it was apparently still possible. And uh, people realized, oh, if this keeps on going on, then we're going to have a real problem with ransomware. And we still have a problem, which we could see from your talk, Carsten, uh, yesterday. So no one actually managed to fix it. Clickjacking gets rediscovered six years late, uh, and I think they, they probably read like Jesse Ruderman's ticket, um, and uh, contrary to Jesse, um, Jeremiah and Robert actually figured out how to market this thing really, really well, and they had, I think, like an Oba's New York talk, and I think that one was pulled because Adobe was making a drama because they found out that you can actually clickjack the camera settings from the Adobe Flash Player and then turn on people's cameras. And if they didn't notice that there was like a green light all of a sudden glowing, then their video was uh, on some server somewhere on the internet and people were having a lot of fun. So this talk didn't happen. Huh? Yeah, but the, just this one. <laughs> this was a good one. <laughs> If you don't have any plans, of course. Oh, uh, maybe I do. <laughs> we'll see. If so, then pass it on, please. All right. 2013. The Earth was supposed to be hit by the meteor. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen, according to the press. <laughs> um, I mean, we're still here, so unless I'm making all this up. Anyway, so it didn't happen. But again, more ransomware. It gets more expensive and more brutal and more effective. And in this particular year, apparently, crypto locker heads, which is still gaining some, some prominence. And they, according to ZDNet, 
managed to kind of collect within a time frame of four days the amazing sum of 27 US dollars, uh, nearly 27 million US dollars by using the Bitcoin from the victims. Four days, 27 mil, that is, that is quite a lot. I think that's a primer actually. And more importantly for us, as web people, iframes get a sandbox to be more secure because until then, we were using iframes left and right, but the content of the iframe could pretty much do whatever they wanted. So uh, when there was like bad code inside that iframe from an advertiser or anything like that, well, it would just execute and there was no restrictions possible aside from this binary mode that IE provided with like uh, restricted frames. And this change in this particular year, and strangely, iframe sandbox is still a feature despite it being very, very awesome that is almost not used by anybody except for security researchers trying to break it because we rarely see the iframe sandbox in action and some web application we see it but not where you actually want it which is like advertising tracking and comparable stuff but anyway it was there and people could use it just didn't so this is combat juggling <laughs> yes. apparently you juggle and then you fight at the same time there's a championship I never tried it, but I was hoping that someone here could demonstrate and get another one of these. No? Too bad, too bad. Anyway, uh, combat juggling. I think the first combat juggling, uh, combat juggling championship was happening in this particular year, and that's, that's how Google Images gave me that particular image. Anyway, this was fun, because in this particular year, eBay got hacked, and a lot of PII was leaking. We had 145 million users affected, and PII, such as names, addresses, dates of birth, and all sorts of stuff got leaked. Um, and then they found out that that the attackers were apparently like a whopping total of 229 days inside eBay's network and they used social engineering because they didn't use any technological attacks. They basically called them, pretended to be employees, got some credentials and then they were in this, and then they basically stayed there, harvested data and nobody noticed. Well, and then something rather sad happened because the uh, CEO back then, John Donahue, he basically said, yeah, well, that was really bad with like the 145 million users. But, I mean, we noticed like a slight decline in user activity, but bottom line, it didn't really matter. It had no impact. I was like, wait, did you get compromised? You have like 145 million credentials leaked, and you basically tell to the press that it didn't really matter so much? That's not good. Like, that's, that's not good for us in here. But factually, eBay's quarter two revenue in 2014 was up by 13%, um, and earnings were up by 6%, so they really didn't notice. Like, it was a massive breach, and no one in the end cared because it had no impact. Too bad. Then one of the most important movies, uh, sorry, not sure how, then one of the most important movies in 2015 got released and it almost didn't disappoint anyone I hear. Uh, so uh, another thing that also didn't disappoint anyone was that an era of glory and triumph ended because Microsoft finally abandoned IE. I mean, we all know that they didn't really, it's still there. We have like this beautiful shiny mode of IE inside Edge that we can activate with like domain policies, but uh, they sort of buried IE and they kind of released Edge. It was actually better. It had a better engine. It was faster. It had a new look, new features, better security. We actually looked at that back then, and it was not that bad, but it didn't really take off because the days were over. It was just like a tad too late, and unfortunately, it didn't have the desired effect, and now the situation is... Yes, please? Question for you. Uh, what is the reason Microsoft decided to abandon IE Edge will now use Blink. That's the Google Chrome engine. Most welcome. I mean, it's better than WebKit, so. <laughs> I mean, they could use Gecko, but I'm not sure if that would be. I don't know. I don't, I don't, it's too much politics. That was a good question. See, it's, it's actually that easy. <laughs> Here you go, sir. Speak later. That's a good question, but no. But that's not worth a ticket. There has to be a better one, sorry. <laughs> anyway, guess who came back in 2016? I was so glad to see it. Britney was back um, after a long break, and at the same time, we realized that C-Surf is that. We just don't get it, which is a pun to my own talk title from last year. Because in this year, in 2016, not only Britney came back, but also Google Chrome released same site cookies in version number 51. And that was actually quite major. It was a tiny change, but yeah, there's a question. <laughs> I'm actually more on the side of free Britney, but uh, like I'm, I'm two steps ahead. <laughs> that was a good question. 
<laughs> you want to? <laughs> I have one. I have one left. So now I'm going to be really, really critical. So this this one needs to count. This has to be a really good one. So C server is pretty much dead because factually, here it goes, sir. Factually, with same set cookies active, you can't do C server anymore. That's a great thing. And another fun thing happened, and uh, there was effectively uh, another breach that also had consequences, but not as many as it probably should have had because Yahoo got hacked. Remember this one? That was so so good. So in September 2016. When they negotiated with Verizon about getting bought, well, I don't know why you would buy Yahoo, but anyway, when they were <laughs> negotiating about getting bought, uh, they were like, yeah, but something happened, you know, like this tiny, tiny thing, and was probably like state-sponsored, very sophisticated, advanced persistent threat, um, definitely not script kiddies. Uh, and someone kind of managed to compromise like 500 million user accounts of ours, like entirely with plain text passwords. So can we now move on with the agenda? And people were like, uh, no. And then in December, like the same year, the number was corrected because we're like, yeah, but we kind of also noticed that it was not, not exactly 500 million. It was a little bit more because it was actually a billion. So, I mean, million, billion, whatever. And <laughs> so they were quite cool about this. And then it took another year to actually pass this. Anyone watch the movie? I didn't watch it. It's too creepy. But uh, they figured out that it was not just like one billion because they found out that it was actually three billion accounts one year later, that there was like multiple groups acting on their servers in parallel, pretty much kicking themselves off those servers because, hey, we're here first, and that every single user account they ever had was compromised, all three billions. That has never happened before, I think, that like a website with so many accounts and every single account gets compromised. Chrome, meanwhile, is dominating the web with pretty much 60% usage share and more. And Andreas Gahl from Mozilla CTO publicly states that Google Chrome has won the second browser war. And here it actually ended. And c server is actually dead and is dead in all browsers. We don't still really use that feature. But meanwhile, almost all relevant browsers actually support same site cookies, even Safari, which took a while. So uh, that's actually quite good. I think the only browser that is commonly used right now and it's not supporting same site is IE11. But correct me if I'm wrong. Not sure. Maybe there was a patch, but I don't think. So. Uh, it's using it, but older versions are there. So it's only supported on the newer versions. Ah, okay. Ah, okay, so it sits on a different, in a different level on the stack. Okay, that makes sense. Cool, thank you. Do you have a ticket already? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anyway, and then the one thing that was not supposed to happen actually happened. I was like, I found not this band. Like, all the bands can have comebacks, but not this one. So the Kelly family came back. Does anybody know the Kelly family? You don't know the Kelly family? That's better if you don't know. Don't Google the Kelly family. Like, seriously, you saved yourself from the trouble of Googling the Kelly family. You do not want to Google that. And it's 2019. Everything is still a thing. XSS is still a thing. SQL injection is still a thing. Cross-site scripting, c -surf, everything is still a thing. And we're still here, and we're still talking about the same things. So I don't want to kind of uh, be overly aggressive with that, but we haven't fixed a single thing in those 20 years. That's pretty epic. I mean, it's good money, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about the future. And now I gotta be fast because I don't have much, I don't have much time left. So as mentioned, this is not stuff that I made up. This is stuff that, yes, there's a question. Why did you brush over the mention of Ajax? Uh, Ajax, ah, this thing. I think it was not really that important. I mean, it's just like, hey, I make a request and something comes back and ooh, my site updates. Sh should I have mentioned it? Yeah, no. no. Sorry. No? no? no. <laughs> Who thinks I should have mentioned Ajax? I, I, I can't vote like, I mean, who thinks I shouldn't have mentioned Ajax? Okay, we have a, I think, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you should have mentioned Harmony though. Ooh, nah. Bad luck, nah. Oh, no, 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 no. That was not noteworthy. Anyway, now we're getting to the point of actually like me presenting. You mentioned Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, we will soon, but that's, this is still. Also, I did mention Bitcoin when talking about the ransomware. <laughs> Joke's on you, Freddy. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about the future. And as I said, like, this is not stuff that I made up. So you can't blame me for what's on the next slides. Um, because that actually came to me in, in visions. And I just like summarized it and put it on the slides. And I want to kind of present to you what my visions think the internet is going to look like in the next years. Um, I don't like most of the things myself. Uh, they're not funny. Please try not to laugh. I'm, I'm not trying to laugh anyway. But uh, let's look at 2020, what's going to happen. So apparent, like according to the visions that I got, um, in 2020, there's going to be a fight that breaks out between the maintainers of CSP 4.0 and the competing standard CSP Next. 
with Chrome supporting CSP Next and Mozilla CSP 4.0. Maybe we're going to talk about this later, Freddy. And we also notice in this particular year that web servers now send at least 10 different security headers per response, which is CSP, CSP Next, XFrame Options, Frame Ancestors, X Content Type Options, HSTS, Super 8, HDMI, and JLo. Um, no, don't. Chrome sets the same side flag for all cookies by default. The entire internet collapses, but it doesn't matter because they can just like change their code. It's easy. And uh, after two to three months of complete internet-wide panic, most of the WW is like sort of working again. And uh, developers complain that there's like no possibilities for CSurf anymore because the applications needed to function and they're re-implemented with a shim and uh, it's back. Um, furthermore, my visions told me that all the OBUS conferences are going to be canceled until 2050 to see if my prophecies are actually accurate and we don't want to interfere with the time axis, so we're just going to leave things as they are. Can you confirm that or not quite yet? Is there plans? Well, let's see. Um, and the year 2022, according to the DE team providing me with these insights and dreams, um, the usual size of the HTTP response center is now pretty much the same as the HTTP body. <laughs> don't laugh, it's not funny. The third browser war is coming to an end and Google buys Mozilla and forces them to delete all the traces of the Gecko engine because why not? And there's like two browser engines left, which is Blink and WebKit. I think it's more than enough, so that's going to be fine. Apple releases the iPhone 13. This has no more buttons, no more apps. Simplicity is key while Cupertino burns down. And Android 11 reaches a market share of 95% overnight. Um, and the Chrome team announces that same site is now deprecated and won't have any effect anymore. And uh, there's, again, internet-wide panic. But since they had a C-Surf shim already, everything is still fine. So it wasn't as bad as before. In the cyber year 2023, Apple has lost their entirety of their phone business, according to my visions. Um, they do an act of desperation and buy Google from their petty cash and force them to delete all traces of Blink. Um, <laughs> They announce a new iPhone that calls you from the inside after you swallow it. <laughs> CSP Next is finally discontinued, and all the efforts are now praised on CSP 5 Gold Pro. Um, and meanwhile, the HTTP response headers have more bytes than the body, because why not? And there's a set of 156 mostly overlapping and non-documented uh, directives that make it quote-unquote easy for developers to finally do the right thing. Um, the EU forbids cookies. Uh, websites fall back to using window name, because why not? Um, majority of companies don't really care because they move their offices to the Bahamas, Neu Bayer, and the St. McAfee Islands. The, legis <laughs> the legislation has absolutely zero effect. Um, and <laughs> only eliminates the small businesses, which no one needs anyway. So. <laughs> In 2024, uh, things get much better um, because Mark Zuckerberg finally becomes the 46th president of the United States. Guess who made it in 2020? Uh, he says in an interview simply with, with his burp face, um, I have Facebook that was easy for me. And uh, he runs Facebook in parallel because now it's legal, buys Apple and forces them to delete WebKit because too many privacy features. Do not track gets rebranded into do now track and no one really notices, just with cookies. Um, there's a group of rebellious teenagers that want to kind of rebel against their privacy affine parents and and uh, track is in the new black, and slogans like this come up. There's bands that call the tracks pistols, and uh, Edward with the scissor hands. What the? <laughs> Facebook OS hits the market. People call it POTOS. Uh, Mark notices and suspends their accounts and takes the Libra. So that was a good idea to have this whole Libra thing. Um, it targets all devices, including smartwatches, Amazon's Alexias, and smart socks. Smart socks, you can imagine like socks that kind of manage to find each other overnight. So they keep like crawling through the flat and use geolocation. And then you have them together, you put them in the washing machine, and it saves the lives of millions. <laughs> so that was pretty good. Uh, 2025, it gets really exciting. Um, the movie Fight Club 2 finally hits box office with Tyler Durden and an aging Miley Cyrus joining forces, and they delete Facebook's like database. Uh, civilization accordingly crumbles, a new civilization arises from the ruins, builds a yikes database, and paving the way for the sequel Fight Club 3. Um, I watched the first one, I'm not gonna watch this one. Uh, the visions were enough. Browsers as such don't really exist anymore. The whole system is now the browser. Um, it replaces the operating system as we know because the browser can do absolutely everything and runs directly on the hardware. Um, and there's not really the need for the operating system anymore because everything is done by the browser in the first place. Linus Torvalds, uh, some of you might know him as the maintainer of the Linux kernel. He's like really happy about that change. He really likes that and changes directions for the Linux kernel itself, which is now a closed source browser extension as the browser is in the US with in-app purchases and really funny but annoying pay-to-win games. 
CSP6 comes out and addresses all browser security problems with just one header, but they use a Turing complete mini language called header script. I, I literally can't wait for that. That was one of the visions where I woke up and was like really sweating. It was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're, we're, we're moving in a fast pace. It's 2028, and uh, Adobe Flash is back. Yes, we still have one of these, by the way. If somebody wants to say something about, about yeah, I'm 8,000 kilometers away from home, and today is my 45th birthday. So I deserve. Yes, yes, that was blunt but valid. Here you go. Enjoy. The much beloved software is now directly running in the operating system, aka browser kernel, and has access to all hardware for just like much better video performance and user experience. And since Adobe was aware that there were security problems in the past, just one, maybe two, they hire the WordPress team as invited experts to take care of that. <laughs> It's just my visions, just, uh, it's not my fault. What WG recommends to so just forget about the HTTP response body, like just like, just like, just use headers. I mean, come on, geez, like we're not in the 90s anymore. It's merely legacy scruff. <laughs> Um, jQuery releases their own header-only version that is like a couple of folded HTTP headers that make up for three megabytes, and it's like even faster than before. And OWASP not running any conferences anymore, uh, which is a shame. Um, he releases finally their new masterpiece, which is the OWASP Internet Suite with the integrated OWASP IDE that allows you to build applications that are super secure with OWASP script. And they also release the OWASP browser, which is super secure, which is running next to the whole thing on the operating system. It's called Owser. Owser is a major success, but people complain that the wiki is not that up to date. Um, <laughs> this is the second one. How do you have so many? <laughs> <laughs> in 2030, um, most of, if not all, it's got to be really bad now. Like, like my visions were really blurry, but I tried to make the best out of them. Most, if not all, personal computers are actually wearables or like clippables, so you can attach them to your body and they talk to the body bus, and then they actually kind of interfere with your brains directly. And a cross-site scripting worm breaks out that targets those features, and it turns out that they still haven't unimplemented the alert function, and the alert function actually gives you like a small electric shock, and it does exactly that. Then it takes a picture of your computer use face, uh, adds the image marker derp, and puts it uh, on some server, and then threatens the victim to kind of release it, unless they pay 500 selfie coin, which is almost as much as 12 jolt coins, 17 feather ream, or 5 cyber krona light. Freddy, there you go with your currencies. <laughs> the AV industry reacts with a new WAF, and it's called Selfie Secure. They uh, attempt to stop the outbreak, and they have huge success. The warm authors get caught and arrested, and they get thrown into something that is known as cyber jail in the future, where you have to work on a very large Office document on a Windows 7 machine with four gigabytes of RAM, <laughs> and you have only 15 years to finish the document. <laughs> Activists say this is torture and very uncool, but they get ignored over all the loads. And 2031, things get much darker. Uh, Obas Corporation buys Netflix. I don't know why. They change all the programming to be web security related and web security education and re-education related. But roughly 99.5% of the viewers don't really like that. And the, the stock just plummets. Like, what were you doing? What are you going to be doing? Um, Prompt is a new alert. This is a show that they kind of tried to release to, to get more people be interested in web security flops, and uh, it just didn't work out as uh, expected. Inspired by the organization Mothers Against Kiss, the organization Fathers Against SSL gets founded, who basically states, our kids have nothing to hide, so we use plain text communications. Uh, Port 80 is receiving a well-deserved renaissance. Um, but later it turns out that it was a false flag operation from intelligence agencies who just kind of tried to tempt people to use less crypto. Um, and it worked. In the year 2035, the new EU, or the EU2, or the new, new <laughs> prohibit selfies in general, I think that's a great thing. Um, I went to some conferences and I got selfie poisoning. So, for, of course, for security and privacy reasons, are to protect the populace. Um, this, however, leads some of the member states, including New India, uh, Italy, and Saxonia, to immediately leave the Union and uh, become uh, countries on their own again. Uh, short after the selfie secure, sorry, AV industry servers get breached, and a total number of 2.5 billion selfies with a shocked expression get leaked over the uh, breach management platform form that is called Pastebin, and uh, first the selfie secure server maintainers state that it was just a few billion selfies, and then a few more billion selfies, and that absolutely all the selfies have been compromised. It's a shame. 
New advertising technology comes out that's called Atsicles, and it allows, I'm not sure where this, this, I don't know whether how they, but it comes out and it kind of allows people to project uh, laser controlled imagery directly on the iris, uh, and you can't escape the ads anymore, which is a great thing for the industry and is much appreciated by the industry leaders. And in 2039, we're almost done, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, 36 actually, sorry, Mark Zuckerberg finally gets challenged and uh, loses his presidency because an AI actually takes over. And the AI, as a AIs do or are known to do basically looks at the way of getting the most votes, which is having claims and slogans like, and now kittens, let's play a game, destroy all humans, but using a chipmunk voice so everybody loves it and votes it up and uh, the AI becomes president. He steps all down from all positions of Facebook. A couple of technologists from the Wear WG seek to bring the glory of the old days back. They find a CD-ROM in some dusty cellar, and it contains a version of the long-lost WebKit engine, and they finally, after 38 years, managed to release version 3.1 of Mosaic. Um, people call it ironic retro-browsing, and it's very, very hip, but over time it turns out to be so awesome that they just leave away the ironic and the retro and just call it browsing. Uh, in the year 2040, um, Popular curved displays that you all have on your desk right now, which kind of release like the pain from your eyes when you work for 10 hours and more, uh, actually get a curve that is 360 degrees and people just don't leave the TVs anymore because that becomes the center of their life or they become the center of the TV. Um, ads are getting directed, uh, pretty much injected directly into the bloodstream, which I find quite scary. <laughs> and they just, just desire to, the, the need to, to, to buy whatever is being advertised. Um, some less ethical advertisers actually choose to kind of uh, also emit the alcohol molecule and they claim... Uh, the slogan, you high, you buy, you, that gets accepted in the wide. And it turns out that uh, they can't be avoided by face buffs anymore, and even modified selfie-secure binaries can't take it because they just like attack the brain directly. The industry is seeking for new solutions, uh, buys random startups en masse with great success. However, a group of students is supposed to develop a new ad blocker, and it's called uBlock. It gets directly into the bloodstream as well and blocks the ads right at the synapse level, which is great. It also blocks bad cycles, which are modified ad cycles that trigger the desire to send Bitcoin. Here we are again to arbitrary as well, and so on. And last but not least, we finally reached the, the gloryful year 2050, and I'm really over time. Uh, and uh, as promised, and as my prophecies and visions told me on Global Upset, and all the conferences come back. Um, people are very confused what this all is. Uh, they don't know the idea of a conference visit anymore, but they really love the hooch cycles, where they add cycles with alcohol. And uh, some still wonder where their CPE credits have gone. Um, an older, very old version of me is being brought up to stage. There's going to be a cross-check which ones of the prophecies actually came true. Turns out all of them, especially the weird ones, and there's never-ending applause, and uh, I get handed over the global cookie jar keys and lordship. And that's it. That's all my material. Thank you very much. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen like this.